So what Beerus said would be quite apt for this story. I now firmly believe that Zamas did nothing wrong. And I think that you will believe that too. And also shed a tear for all of his subjects. Hey guys, Masako X here. Now today we are taking something that is a little bit innocuous when you first look at it, but when you really look at it and understand the implications that this thing may have had, you will begin to realize that if said thing had happened, things may have turned out differently for the likes of future Trunks. And best of all, he and Mai wouldn't have had to huddle together in a multiverse that already has a Mai and Trunks, like Whis and Beerus had no clue what to do with them, like as if they hadn't do done the job before. I'm not gonna lie, it's probably one of the biggest missteps that Super had ever made. But yeah, I'm getting sidetracked. Have you guys ever wondered what if Zamasu came to a different conclusion after watching the two fighting barbarians? Basically, the subtitle of the story could be described as, at the request of Havarok, what if Zamasu played Siv? AKA, what if Sid Meier existed in the Dragon World? Now, where did we get this idea from? The source of this is a regular fixture these days, thanks to a recent addition in the last couple of months on the channel. If you haven't checked one out already, Myself and my pals in the world of What If Re present the What If Roundtable livestream. We work on answering your immediate What If questions and scenarios. We also sometimes get certain stories which are too good to surmise in just a minute or two. These need to be covered in a full video, and today is one of those examples. One of the viewers of our Roundtable streams, Project Sixum, asked this very question, and we are more than happy to deliver the answer to it. In this continuity, Zamasu still witnesses two of the barbarians fighting each other, to which he reacts you know, understandably you know, with disgust. I believe that this is one of the first times that he has seen mortal life up close as part of his training under Gawasu, the Supreme Kai of Universe 10. And let's say it didn't get off to a good start. Zamasu is filled with resentment and shows a huge amount of willingness to destroy their miserable planet. These monsters don't deserve the big Toblerone, not at all. Now this, of course, I mean understandably, it greatly shocks Goasu. Now I'm sure this would be a time where he would just shout ZAMAS, as he often did in the Japanese dub. It became a bit of a mini meme in the community, didn't it? So, like in the original, Goasu is trying to sway Zamasu to prove that mortals aren't just simply set in stone like he's seeing right now. They can evolve and refine themselves if worthy of progression. He in turn takes his pupil into the future to reveal that he was wrong and not really much has changed here. The only difference here is that these creatures have clubs. Basically, this is the barbarian equivalent of the Flintstones happening. Yabba dabba bonk! Also the name barbarian? Yeah. I get the feeling that Toriyama wasn't really trying that hard with the name puns the day he came up with that name. Yeah, you could do a lot better sir, we know you can. In the original timeline, this sight confirms in Zamasu's mind that mortals are useless and the cogs begin to turn in his mind, which ultimately then lead him to the Zero Mortal Plan. But that would basically be just doing the regular timeline again, and that's not the point of a what if. In this reality though, Zamasu gets another idea instead. Unlike before, where he's seething with inner rage and turmoil at the sight of these creatures, Zamasu actually listens to some of his master's musings about evolution and that not all creatures are simply brain dead and hopeless, lost causes you could say. Zamasu is actually having an epiphany, something that actually works with his backstory and is in keeping with his character. You see, a lot of talk had been mentioned prior to now about Zamasu and his capability. He was a whirlwind talent who had risen through the ranks of Kaidem and became the current North Kai of Universe 10 at a very young age. Well, I mean, relatively young for a Kai that is, so I'm guessing probably just a few millennia? You don't get that far that fast without having some radical ideas or bucking the system in order to get things changed though. You have to have made a dent in the universe prior to now as it were. So with this, Zamasu is gating down at not a zero mortal plan, but just simply his mortal plan. Here, he sees the barbarians and their behavior as the effect of the needless limitations that all the Supreme Kais have just put onto themselves. And what I mean by this is that the Supreme Kais, like the Guardian of Earth did, Kami, would omit themselves from venturing into their own domains unless its fate was greatly threatened, like Shin did with Majin Buu. But, you know, 
It led to a disconnect between the two, and Zamasu feels that this has led to evolution being greatly stymied and halted. He would basically think, well, no, the Supreme Kais and the Kais are meant to get involved instead of just hanging around on their own sacred world and just playing for most of their lives. That's just not how it works. These mortals that Zamasu sees before him have proven in his mind that these beings cannot function on their own. They are clearly too foolish to change on their own. And even if they do end up doing it, it would take far too long to do so in order to be prosperous or indeed useful in his eyes for an efficient amount of time. And even then, if they did reach that potential, they'd probably just blow themselves up anyway. So they need a divine guide who will reshape them. And that's him. These mortals, they need my help. Goasu turns to Zamasu and is puzzled. My dear boy, you are helping them. By us watching over them, we are ensuring their prosperity. No, so in a rebellious act. Zamasu decides to get stuck in with the models of Universe 10, and he makes it his mission in life to start this change and make these brutes into the perfect race that he envisions. To really show that he is the best candidate for becoming the next Supreme Kai, and even up the mortal level of Universe 10. I mean, this is far better practice for doing so than just making tea for Goasu. If he can pull off this bold maneuver with such a heinous race like the Barbarians, he could tame every single race in the universe. Universe 10 would become the pinnacle of evolution and refinement. Something that the Grand Priest and the Omni King would look down on with pride, and Rumshi, their own G.O.D., would respect, and they would work together on a regular basis. So of course, he's going to need some extra tools to make this work fully, and as a result, Zamasu borrows one of the Time Rings and starts his plan in order to show his dominance. Like I said, Zamasu isn't playing by the traditional conventions of the Supreme Kai and Kaiden. He is resorting to massive distortions of time travel like in the original, but at least here he is doing something about it instead of just whining about it incessantly in the episodes, am I right? But of course, when he initially descends down to the Barbary surface, he is met with hostility. The two fighting barbarians stop their squabble and turn their focus on to Zamasu. He is a threat because he's green. They attempt to ambush him, but are easily defeated as you could imagine. This is Zamasu after all, someone whose power is roughly equivalent to a Super Saiyan 2 Goku. Now, in a fit of blind rage at this interloper defying their brutish whims, one of these oafs tries to make Zamasu pay for this act of disgrace and just for the fact that he's green. But the young Kai quickly deals with him, cutting him in the half with a keyblade. Yeah, he may be wanting to improve these guys' lot in life, but he's not going to be nice about it, that's for sure. These are monsters in his eyes that need to sometimes be treated with a stick. And as he thought, this act gets the correct response from the other one. The other creature is able to recognize Zamasu's power and backs down, bowing his head and slowly quivering his knees. Despite him being twice the size of Zamasu, almost three times the size, he's now acting submissively. Good, says Zamasu under his breath. Well, at least these cretins understand what power is. This may be a useful tool in reworking those imbeciles into a better species. It may be a little simple for my liking, but it'll do for now. To his surprise, though, the surviving creature is able to utter actual words. The survivor carefully asks in fear. Uh, who, who will you be? Zamasu turns around and looks impressed, albeit patronizingly so. Oh, you morons can talk? I'm amazed. Then that means you will be able to understand what I'm about to tell you. Who I be? Well... I be your god. The scene is still for a moment. It's very tense. Before the barbarian breaks the silence by dumbly asking, uh, What's a god? Well, that certainly took the wind out of Zamasu's sails now, didn't it? Zamasu sighs and explains that gods are beings who created the land and the sky, that they are currently residing in. They govern over the moon and the stars. They can make the sun go away and then make the sun come back again. They basically can do anything that these simple barbarian minds could dream of. God, God strong? Yes, gods are very strong. Stronger than you will ever be. The barbarian's mind is completely blown. He falls to his knees and bows his head. This green fellow might be even more powerful than the chieftain. Zamasu then decides to start using pleasantries. I say, dear creature, what's your name, if indeed you have one? The creature looks up and mutters, Rowhood. 
Zamasu smirks. Good, Roward. You are now my prophet. Now, go forth and tell your people that I'm very displeased with them. Roward's head tilts confusedly. What be a prophet? Zamasu is looking a little exasperated. These fools need a lot of terminology explained to them, after all. It means that you speak to a god. You are my prophet, and you then tell people that you have spoken to me, your god. You do remember what one of those is, right? Zamasu then sends Rawa to the nearest village and observes him from afar. He can see, though, that he is met with laughs and general bullying. Rawad recoils in fear, but one of his audience members grabs him and grabs on tight. It's the biggest barbarian, who Zamasu assumes to be the chieftain, and he's holding poor Rawad by his neck. And since it was clear that these mortals don't listen to pure hearsay, Zamasu hands are going to have to get dirty. Zamasu uses a key blast to blow up the chieftain's hut, much to the shock of every inhabitant of the village. This, of course, means that the chieftain lets Rawad go. Because, you know, his house is burning down. The chieftain is horrified that his abode is pretty much gone. It's just reduced to cinders. He then wheels back around and roars, What be a trick? Rawad, explain! Rawad gets up slowly and feels more confident. His god must have rescued him. That be the god! The green god is angry with us! God? Me see no god! Where is god? His words are cut by a stray key blast that removes his arm. There's your god, you incredible oaf. Now, by Zamasu's logic, in a society that values absolute strength and hunting skills, losing an arm will be practically an unrecoverable act, or at least a massive disgrace. The chieftain roars in pain. Zamasu uses this opportunity to telepathically contact Rawad and orders him to repeat what he's about to say to everyone around him. Zamasu, through Rawad's voice, explains that he, Zamasu, is their god and is very disappointed in them. He has seen their future and they do nothing to grow as a species. And if they don't change their ways right now, not only will they fail to reach their ultimate potential, their green god will be forced to destroy them all. Fortunately, this divine act works for the barbarians, who then ask Zamasu for his guidance. He then gives them the basics for building better sheds, the secrets of crafting, as well as rudimentary farming and agriculture. I mean, it takes a little while since the barbarians aren't exactly the smartest creatures going, but you know, it slowly comes together. And remember, they're basically lizard creature people. And Zamasu also explains to them the art of blacksmithing, but make sure that they only attack those who don't want to follow his teachings. He orders them to only end their lives as a last resort if they really don't want to convert. He is aware that he won't be able to fully remove violence from them completely, certainly not at this early stage, but at least he can use this behavior for something a little more constructive than what they were doing before he'd arrived. Now, in order to speed up the process for himself, Zamasu performs a couple of twists of his time ring, time jumps, to see how his little society is growing over the next few years. Sure enough, it's looking good. Zamasu's ego is being fed by Rawad, who makes a few totems in his likeness. For now, he will be speaking only to Rawad, who has grown quite accustomed to the role of being the prophet of Zamasu. It's even approved his speech and diction a bit. Of course, there are some attempts made to end Rawad's life, but Zamasu stops them all from a distance, acting as their ruler, and just confirming that Rawad is protected and the worthy prophet. Moreover, he established a new ritual for succession, where if someone wants to challenge the rule of a chieftain, they first need to challenge and defeat the old one and ask for his blessing. That way, he can keep their inner violent tendencies in check. The old chieftain is quickly defeated due to his wounds by one of his sons. The son goes by the name of Ulop, and he is more eager to accept Zamasu as the divine leader of their race, and orders to build the first ever temple to Arkai. As Rawad is aging, Zamasu encourages him to take a few students on board that will specialize in spreading Zamasu's teachings once Rawad had passed. To those who are the most talented, Zamasu would then speak to them personally via telepathy. This signaling who was worthy and who wasn't worthy, like a badge of honor, is very important to barbarian culture, so Zamasu's are beginning to understand them. He knows that his protégé won't live forever though, and so he is going to have to find a suitable replacement and he will have to help his charge. 
He also ensures Rawa that after his life is at an end, he will go to a better place because of his great service to Zamasu. He even gives him the luxury of choosing his successor personally. And this honour goes to Karpen, the most eager student of Rawa. And this reminds Zamasu of the day when Goasu chose him to be his successor, of the happiness and pride that he had shown. He hopes that these wretched creatures could at least feel a portion of that pride. But not long after this though, Rawad goes away peacefully in the night. Zamasu is almost sad. He'd actually grown quite attached to the simpleton over these years. But nevertheless, this is good solid foundations for his plan. Now it's time to check what will happen if he leaves these fools for a couple of hundred years with only his instructions for guidance. Zamasu goes to the future and discovers a massive castle and a prospering kingdom. He is very pleased. This is a very good start. However, he quickly notices two marching armies of barbarians wearing different flags and colours. What's even more worrying is the fact that both of these flags have his likeness on them. So as we had established in the previous outing, our Kayan training was showing that, really, he can do well playing a proper leader, albeit from afar. Somosu had brought the barbarians to some level of advancement in very little time. He's basically acted like the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey here, only more green and with more fabulous hair, and could talk. Hmm, maybe that analogy was a little odd, you see. Now granted, it's good to see that these peoples were capable of having sprawling kingdoms like this, but that will be all for naught if it all gets torn down by this happening and they just bicker amongst themselves. And what makes the matters worse here is that both armies have flags and banners with his likeness, albeit with slight variations. Now Zamasu gulps to himself as he gazes down on the scene. Perhaps he left things a little too long with the gap between visits. Maybe he should have made it shorter. A couple of centuries? Oh, maybe mortals weren't ready for that level of absence. I know that you're thinking that he could just use the time ring to go back and fix things, take the easy way out here, and he does think about that option. It's very tempting, but no, that's not what a proper Supreme Kai would do. He wouldn't run away from the problem. He promised Goasu he would take responsibility for whatever happened, and this is about to happen. Besides, if he can fix this disaster now without having to resort to time ring shenanigans, he would be lauded even more than he already is. But it might not be wise to just go blundering in right this second and just go, Hey everybody, I'm your creator. Now stop all this fighting here or I'll have to destroy you. And as the two groups move closer and closer to each other, he hides in the nearby forest atop of some trees. And by doing so, that gives him a good view on the battlefield as a whole and materialises some hooded robes so as to not have anyone recognise him if they decide to look up and make things really kick off. And yes, I think Closed Beam is part of Akai's choice of, you know, powers. And we assume that Zamasu would know such a thing. I mean, Piccolo can. Zamasu at the moment is looking a bit wistful, almost missing the days of simpler times when clubs were the only thing he had to worry about. He leans backwards and just looks to the sky. Oh, Roward, what have your descendants done? If only you were here. His musings are cut short, though, when what sounds like the main fracas begins below. The skirmish seems to be pretty brutal, and it seems that the barbarians have taken the smithing lessons to their heart and actually listened because the weapons that they have created and are using right now seem pretty potent. In this instance, Zamasu does feel a little bit more proud, since at least these puny mortals listened to his instructions and created something useful with their lives. For a while, things settle into the typical affair for this kind of tussle, but there is something in the corner of his eye that catches our young Kai in training's attention. Zamasu watches the two leaders of the factions commanding from the hills and facing each other, and they are decked up in something he had never seen before on these creatures, and it was really impressive. Actual clothes, and not just clothes, suits of armour, which, albeit a little rough around the edges, looked pretty good. Excellent! A fight with honour, something he never thought possible from these people, but now he's seeing it. Maybe a permutation of what he'd instilled in them all that time ago, you know, if a king wants to become the new king, he has to fight the old king, etc. Zamas has a lot to do and catch up with on Barbary, and so Arkai decides to investigate nearby towns to see how the regular folk have progressed. 
still cloaked, he decides to really get himself immersed amongst the lay folk. And as he walks through, things seem rather quaint. It had been a while since the time of Rawa's ruination, which was the last time that Zamasu was here. He decides that he won't end these mortals just yet. Not everything is lost right now, but one thing's for sure. He needs to find out what caused the situation in the first place and why his likeness seems to be the focal point of it all. He adjusts his robes using his key, which acts well enough to make him resemble a barbarian in disguise, albeit a small one, and checks the nearby town to hear in on conversations. Bit of eavesdropping wouldn't hurt. Most of the townsfolk who aren't taking part in the fighting are hiding in their houses, but from what he can gather, their language has evolved considerably. They are actually able to speak seemingly well, especially for them. And in fact, some of it has changed so much that Zamasu can barely make out the words on all the signage that is around the town. He can vaguely understand that that must mean tavern or that's a blacksmith there. So he decides to check the local temple out. Is his visage intact there? What a Rawad. Was he well respected to? He really liked that one. And sure enough, it is. It is decorated with some marvellous stained glass windows that show his likeness alongside Rawad and his successors. The sight of the lesser creatures reaching to him, Zamasu, adorned with riches and splendour, fills the Kai with pride, which is very unbecoming for someone of his ilk, but no matter. No other Kais or Goasus watching. He gazes around a little further. From the statues commemorating all the leaders of his church, he learns that the current prophet is named Karnil and is supposedly the greatest prophet of them all. Hmm, he'll be the judge of that. But wait, something isn't right here. Prophet Karpan, the one after Rawad, is missing. He was supposed to be the next in line after Rawad. That's very strange. He quite liked that young barbarian too. Very eager. He stops a local priestess who's just walking around and asks about Carnil. She scoffs at him for being a mere ignorant peasant that knows nothing about the gift of the great creator. Zamasu decides to keep asking questions about this. Too many questions, it seems. After a while of this, the mentor seems suspicious and prods the cloak, which is a little billowy for her liking. Here. Are you the one of the Carpanian spies? Because if you are, then I must ask you to leave. You have no business inside these great walls. What say you? Zamasu tries to play his role of a dumb peasant for a little bit longer, but he feels that this is actually beneath him, and therefore he ends up actually acting like a really poor interpretation of a dumb peasant. A uh, Carpanian spies? Never heard of them! <laughs> The priestess is having none of this tomfoolery and calls the guards on him. Wait, why would a temple need a holding cell? Were things really that bad with these so-called Carpenian spies? They will deal with him after the battle, it seems, when their king will teach his kind a lesson. Zamasu decides not to take action against them right now. He wants to see this king up close. He's got some time to contemplate after all. In silence, Zamasu figures out how he will handle this predicament. You know kind of handle it so that means he doesn't go too ham without resorting to the time ring when he notices that someone is with him in the cell looking at him he is not alone this someone is a very peculiar looking barbarian looking pretty sickly and pale yes these creatures were as big as before but this is still pretty small and sleek for a barbarian he's not very large and muscular like the others being rather skinny in fact his eyes are a purplish tint instead of the blue why did they put you in here, stranger? He asks politely, his diction being rather eloquent despite his meek form. Zamasu decides to grant him dialogue for the moment. I mean, honestly, he could do with something interesting going down. I'm here because I wanted to be here. Oh, I see. Clever. Trying to avoid army service, I suppose. The creature smiles at Zamasu, showing its white teeth. Now tell me, what is the purpose of this war? The creature eyes Zamasu, puzzled. Where has this guy been all this time if he has no clue about the incident going down before their very eyes? For a moment, this guy is thinking that his new cellmate here is probably playing the fool, but he decides to tell him anyway in case he is rather foolish and he stepped out of line. This is not merely a childish squabble, stranger. This is a centuries-old war between the Ralwadians and Carpenians. This whole thing it started around the ideas that they had. You see, 
they have different ideas about the Creator's will and what the Creator had intended for our kind. Somerset's eyes widen. This was all about him. But Carpen's people had turned against Roward? It's a shame. What are those ideas, if I may ask? At this point, even this feeble barbarian is becoming pretty suspicious. Who are you? How can you not even know the basic ideas of the Creator? Everyone does, even the poor folk who can't even read. What's your deal? He asks. Answer my questions and I shall answer yours, friend. This whole thing started because the Rawadians believed that the Chronicle is everything. The legendary book taught us how to be who we are and what we are about to become. The words of the Creator himself are written into these holy scrolls. Those lessons need to be attributed to everything that we do. However, the Carpenians think that these are more like guidelines that are helping us to grow instead of hard and fast rules that should be stuck to. More of an interpretation, the barbarian smiles. I believe that they are both idiots. Zamasu is fascinating hearing this jaded being come alive as his vitriol bubbles to the surface. I believe that there is no creator. There never was. Rawad made the whole thing up. The creator was merely an idea that was used to rule over my people through fear. Though, if I had to side with one, I would side with the Carpenians. At least they have some kind of wiggle room. Zamasu's getting rather intrigued by this creature, as the language that it uses is pretty advanced, even more advanced than the townsfolk. This one surely could read. Maybe it was a scholar. So, what's your story? Your turn, Barbarian continues to smile. Zamasu laughs coldly and gestures at the Barbarian. Give me your hand. This should answer your question. After a moment's hesitation, the creature agrees with this. The hand is scaly and cold, but in just a fraction of a second, Zamasu uses Kaikai Kai to transport them both to a nearby forest, the same area that he was in when he first arrived in this timeline. The barbarian is truly shocked, hiding in the shadows from the sun that's blinding him. He hasn't seen the sun in ages as well. And then he drops his disguise. This is a trick, right? The barbarian doesn't look phased by the way he looks. You said you didn't believe in me. Well, here I am. Do I look like a trick to you? The barbarian hesitates. Then, with a lot of effort, gathers some energy into his hand and spits out a small key blast at Zamasu. But the Kai deflects it with ease. <laughs> that was the most pathetic and yet impressive thing I've seen in my entire life. Tell me, is this ability common amongst your species? No. The Carpenians wanted to study the properties and potential of these powers. They were remarkable. But the Rawadians didn't like that one bit. They decided to hunt down most of the people who possessed this gift. You can say that this is what started the war. To my knowledge, I am the last. I haven't shown anyone before. You should be honoured. Zamasu smiles. Now very, very intrigued by this pathetic looking creature. More so than before. At least he knows how this all started. For real this time. What is your name? Decraft, the barbarian mutters. Pathetic. But listen, Dekraf, this is your lucky day, because I'm in the market for a new prophet, and you and I have a war to end. There was a moment of absolute silence. Zamasu had just offered this non-believer to, ironically, become his next vessel. But said potential vessel had not exactly jumped for joy at this. But let's make one thing straight here. Zamasu had chosen to reveal himself to Dekraf. The mood is tense as the hooded barbarian clenched its scrawny hands and looked like it was about to respond with all of its might. The creature was eyeing his potential maker in the face, but the longer it did, the less afraid it became. And that chestnut was a bit too unsettling for Zamasu's liking. Supreme Kai's and their apprentices dealt with absolutes, so to have all this postulating and pontificating going on, as well as dawdling, was very unusual despite his previous exposure to barbarians. It was making him uncomfortable and especially impatient. But before he could do anything about it, or voice his displeasure at the tedium, something unexpected happened. After a moment's more worth of silence, the scrawny and pale barbarians smiled for what felt like the first time since they had first clapped eyes on each other, and that took our Kai off guard. 
Bekrav took it one step further and began to chuckle to himself whilst looking immensely satisfied, like he told himself a joke. Zamasu snapped back. What is so funny? Am I missing something, Dekrath? You'd better not be making light at my offer. Most of your simple kind would leap at this chance. He's trying to throw in a little bit of a threat in this coded message. Dekrath tilts his head, seemingly amused, but Zamasu was not getting his answers in a timely manner and he was getting angrier and angrier. Answer me! I do not tolerate jest well, mortal. I did not make you like this. And there it is. I guess from your reaction that we didn't turn out the way you had hoped. Am I right, maker? Dekrath laughs louder, but Zamasu is thrown off guard even more so than before. What? What do you mean? He's trying to keep his cool, but failing miserably. The barbarian gestures around him, motioning the foliage around them and implying the conflict that's going on nearby. Everything. Everything is a colossal disappointment in your eyes. We are failures, and that's gotten you mighty nettled, hasn't it? Dekraft closes his eyes and crosses his arms as if to justify his statement even further. Zamasu stares back in absolute disbelief. How dare he? How dare this simpleton mock his maker right in front of him, no less? This pathetic mortal should be taught some manners instead of being allowed to get away with saying such drivel. How could such a lowlife disregard his presence? His kind should be all too eager to crawl beneath Zamasu's own feet. Maybe this scoundrel was right, though. Perhaps this whole exercise was pointless. He could just end it right now and go back to his original plan to fix mortals like this never occurred. Just wipe it away. Zamasu charges the key blast up slowly in his hand as if to do just that. I'll have you know that I will have no problem with ending your miserable life, Dakraf. If you don't start showing me some respect, I can easily destroy you. Thinking that Dekraft would quiver with fear at this response, Zamasu begins to laugh louder than this naysayer, but the reaction back is not what he expected. I am well aware that you care, my lord, but you won't do that, because as we already established, you need me. I mean, you may try to find someone else who would listen to you bleed on and on and on for hours, but I believe that none of them will serve as well as I will, and you know that. And why is that? Dekrov smiles back big time, showing his teeth. Because we are both aware that most of my brethren are, from the lack of a better term, idiots. This takes Zamasu by surprise. Self-awareness? Belittling themselves? Willing to call his own kind morons? Now this catches the Kai's interest. And what makes you so different? I was a scholar. A pretty rare profession in this neck of the woods, as I'm sure you would be able to tell. Especially to be someone of education who is not connected to any of the two temples, one of which you stumbled into earlier. I have spent most of my life seeking how the world really works, and quite frankly, it is not how either of those nuthouses see it. Zamasu stood still for a moment. This was absolutely infuriating, but also fascinating. On one hand, he wanted to just end this arrogant creature here and now and be done with this whole farce. But on the other hand, this specimen could be one of the most intriguing products of this entire experiment. Dekraft had seemingly broken the mold of what had gone before him, independent thought, and grown not only semi-intelligence, but also the ability to think on his own without the need of a consensus. It would be a waste to end him right now. There was something there that needed to be maintained, fostered, nurtured, developed. A third way, perhaps. So, my lord, the barbarian bows his head a little bit. What's the plan? Zamasu wasn't expecting this kind of indirect acceptance, but on the inside, he is grateful that he didn't have to end this person's life right now. This could be the start of something absolutely crucial to his experiment, and to prove to Goasu he was ready to become the next Supreme Kai a lot sooner than what was first thought. That is the goal, after all. I am glad that you have seen sense and chosen the only route that doesn't lead to your doom. Well, if you indeed wish to be useful, then tell me where we can find the king of these lands. Dekraft sits back down and motions Zamasu to do the same. 
he tells him everything he knows to catch him up for all of the centuries of being in absentia. In this conversation, Zamasu learned a lot about this land and how it had changed since the simpler times of Rawad. It turns out that the main Rawadian lands where his words resonated the most was a place called Siberia and currently is at odds with a realm named GNT, the country state of the Carpenians. So far, so simple. The current king of the Rawadian barbarians was a creature called Craig the Great. Zamasu was amused. <laughs> Look at that. They started to give themselves titles. And such an ostentatious title at that. He will be the judge of who is great soon enough. He can be sure of that. But then, the Kai puts two and two together. He realizes that the creature that was leading the troops just now had to be Craig the Great. Dakraf also explained to him that Craig is just a pawn of Carnil, the real person in charge of the Rawadian sect. And at his core, he seems like a very weak ruler. Sure, he may have been a good figurehead in terms of a battle and a poster-like icon for the group, but deep down, he seemed to be just a puppet for the real people in charge of their destiny. Think Palpatine and Vader. This is excellent information to wield, and Zamasu knows just how to make good use of it. Using instantaneous movement, different from Goku's instant transmission, he transports himself and Dekraft directly into the king's throne room, which is currently unoccupied by the ruler, understandably, since he's currently in the middle of a little argy-bargy just now. Naturally, the guards stationed in the throne room are surprised to see them just appear here, but Zamasu quickly dispatches them without even opening his eyes to acknowledge them even being in the room. And this startles Dekraf quite a bit. This maker is ruthless in achieving his ends. It was a good thing that he hadn't done the same to Dekraf here before. But then Zamasu hides behind the throne, ordering Dekraf to take a seat on the throne and do what he says. Dekraf hesitates a little bit, but does as he's told, as all will become clear soon enough. When Craig the Great returns with his escort after a successful battle, he is irritated and outraged to see a weakling in his throne. Servant, are you out of your mind? Leave my throne immediately, and I may show you some mercy. Dekraf smirks and doesn't move. Try to remove me then, your highness. This enrages Craig and is pleasing Zamasu from behind the chair. He's good, Zamasu thinks. A little too good. Craig sends his guards to deal with the intruder, but Zamasu is able to blast them all away from behind the throne, making it seem like Dekraf was the one doing the deed, which terrifies Craig greatly. You see what I did there? As he is about to escape, fearing for his own life, Dekraf stops him with a soft voice. Or rather, it's Zamasu doing the talking, using telekinesis and telepathy to make Dekraf float and talk in his stead. Stay. Craig is slowly losing all of his composure. Our maker is not happy with us. The, the prophet decide. Craig mutters, being held over the ground and slowly pulled in Dekraf's direction. That is right. I am the new prophet, not Carnil. I am telling you, your highness, that he immensely hates what you have done with the place. Dekraf shakes his head, motioning to the room around them and the world at large, acting like he personally was disappointed, getting way too comfortable in the throne for Zamasu's liking. Craig then calls for more help, but every servant or guard that was left in the crown room was either dealt with or had escaped or had not returned from the battle yet. Craig was on his own. But we can regain his favor back, your highness. We can? Zamasu lets Craig go, which causes him to collapse clumsily to the floor. He used that small window of opportunity to appear before Craig personally. Seeing the maker right there in front of him, instead of just on pieces of paper or drawings, causes Craig to cower, begging Zamasu for forgiveness. What an irritating toady. Those brutes with clubs back in the day seem like an improvement in comparison. Please stand up, my friend. You have work to do. I've been watching you for a very long time, and as my prophet has just so expertly stated, I'm not happy with the current state of affairs. I need you two to help me reunite my people. You can just speak to Carnil and the Carpinian leader. 
I'm sure they will listen. Samasu holds his hand up to silence the mewling faker. As tempting as that may be, that would be too easy. I'd rather you guide your own people instead of asking me to do all the work for you. After all, the barbarians are the ones that have something to prove, not me. Or do you have a different opinion, Craig the Great? From this moment on, Dacraft will be my eyes and ears. I need you two to convince as many as you can that Carnil and the Carpinians are leading your people astray. And those who won't listen? Well, you are warriors after all. And as much as I want to get rid of your violent nature, it is something that needs to be undertaken one step at a time, I suppose. Unnecessary force was never my thing, but necessary force, however. Dekraf bows politely before Zamasu. We will not fail you, my lord. Zamasu glares at his new sidekick. Of course you won't. And with that, the barbarians started preparation for the great unification conflict. Zamasu was watching them from behind the scenes, giving Dekrav everything that he needs to know, good instructions. But the barbarian was a surprisingly good understudy. Some smaller kingdoms even believed his words without his benefactor needing to give him guidance. He was good on his own. Carnil, however, took this as a personal insult and sent some assassins to take care of the new prophet. Zamasu had to act quickly in order to save his protege. I can tell that this Carnil is a real bore already. You may talk the talk, my prophet, but you are lacking where it matters. Dekruff snarls back. You need to teach me how to defend myself! You dare to tell me what to do? Is it not enough that I made you a prophet? More important that you ever become on your own? No, but I don't think you want to babysit me, my lord. And you seem to be familiar with my inert powers. Giving me some training will only benefit you. You can leave me to do what you desire and get on with whatever it is that you do. Now that, Samasu was able to see some logic in that. Besides, his prophet could impress those people better with some proper key blasts going for him and a means of making people do what they want. And so he agrees to train him. But the road to strength is going to be long and a rocky one at that as Dekraf wasn't really born to be an absolute fighter, and he lacks the natural talents of characters like Goku. Given his physiology, had Dekraf gained the power of key control, he might have easily blended into the background as just being a feeble being, only known for book smarts in a society where book smarts aren't exactly treasured. And although any barbarian out there can be certainly bigger and bulkier than, let's say, a human, he is still far behind from what Zamasu could expect from a barbarian or what he wishes from him. In a normal situation, he would resort to time travel and buy some more time going backwards, but he's actually getting into the spirit of the challenge of a true master pupil dynamic. He wants to do it right, but even he is starting to have his limits of resilience being tested, putting up with the struggling Dekraf. Dekraf, if you won't try well enough, I will be forced to disown you. This, after all, was your idea, the Green Kai proclaims in a manner that could be considered as haughty. The Barbarian merely scoffs at this bluster, knowing Zamasu quite well at this stage. Remember, he is pretty sassy and perceptive as well. I am sorry, my lord. Being kept locked away in holding cells for the last few years doesn't exactly help with keeping your body in shape. Zamasu's patience wasn't entirely extinguished, as what his understudy lacked in physical strength he got pretty creative with key techniques. He made up for that. I mean, once he'd gotten a bit better and had a better grip of those abilities, of course. At least Dekruff had something going for him. He could even mimic his own energy blade attack to some extent. Not as good as he, of course, you know, but not too bad for a mortal. Zamas was almost impressed. Or at least somewhere between being impressed and disgusted and considering this a heinous act. The only thing keeping him from punishing his apprentice for learning that attack on his own is the fact that he needs Dekraf. The barbarians scraped together some kind of meaningful games, and the army of the new prophet turned out to be quite successful. What also helped was that Dekraf was a far better diplomat than Zamasu could ever be or could give him credit for. He was able to recruit the Carpenian leader, Emma, to their cause with little convincing and not an ounce of physical threatening at all. Carnil, though, was furious to hear about this. He had been left out of the picture, forgotten throughout all of this. And this act was just yet another example of what he felt and was becoming a fruitless venture. 
After all, it had been told that this new united temple has the blessing of the creator himself. So it was decided then. Carnil, in an act of impudence and desperation, decides to just deploy all of his troops at once, his entire army, against the land of Siberia. He thought that he had managed to give Dekraft the slip, but no, not even close. Zamas was watching the whole thing go down naturally from afar, up on high. But Ellers and Craig the Great's troops were able to overpower the ones of Carnil with little difficulty. The morale in his ranks had become pretty low, and the soldiers had gradually lost their will to fight. Not only that, but Dekrab was blasting their siege machines with some actually decent key attacks that would have looked not too shabby around the time of the trunk saga of Z. Knowing that the jig was up, the losing ruler reacts, I will destroy you, you unbelievers! Screeched Carnil angrily from the comfort of his sedan chair, situated on a hill overlooking the battlefield, but his threats were very empty, as the soldiers slowly just started to leave of their own accord, leave the field, leaving the shrieking Carnil vulnerable. I mean, things were so bad, even the carriers of the chair left him not too long afterwards. And before he was able to run away from the chair itself, leaving the chair completely unawares, he was confronted by Dekraft directly. Carnil was pretty old and decrepit, and was madly eyeing Dekraft with insanity in his eyes. How, how dare you? you? You are nothing! I am the voice of the creator! No, Dekraft smiled, surrounding himself with a menacing key. I am. Carnil leapt up in a fit of blind fury and tried to impale Dekraft with a dagger through his chest, surprising actually the younger barbarian completely. Even though Dekraft was actually sort of wounded, Dekraft could still manage to blast the old creature away, but the dagger was starting to have an effect on his body after all. Dekraft was slowly starting to fade away. Zamasu was watching the whole time, choosing not to help his apprentice directly, admiring the irony of the situation in fact. On one hand, this would have been a fitting end, a conclusion for his latest prophet, and would make Dekraft somewhat of a martyr for his cause, something that he could potentially need going forward. On the other hand though, this snarky creature had his uses still, and his people might still need his guidance for a little bit longer. Perhaps this wasn't the right time for him to slip away, not just yet. And since Zamasu wasn't a Supreme Kai yet, that meant that he still possessed the powers of healing. I mean, oh well, what could possibly go wrong? Let's let the mortal live a little longer. Zamasu does decide to save the life of his prophet, much to Dekraft's astonishment. This time, he did not care if he was seen or not. This act of healing was a way of sending a message to any eavesdroppers. The creator did exist. He removes the weapon and seals the wound. You're welcome, he smirked. So thank you. My lord, Dekroth exhaled loudly, not expecting the creature to actually be assisting him. You will have to take it from here, Dekroth. My time here is over, for now at least. This may be the last time that we see each other, my friend. Dekroth gasps, Zamasu turns away. I will be back in a couple of centuries to see if your people have messed up again or not. It is your job to try and prove me wrong, mortal. So does this mean? Farewell? Indeed. It's been a good run. Yes. Yes, it has, my lord. Samasu, I was actually feeling a little touched by this. This was probably the first time that the words, my lord, hadn't been spoken sarcastically by his servant. Good. He learnt. He actually had a certain fondness to this one himself. So before he uses the time ring to go forward in time to see how the barbarians actually fare, he ascends into the air, making a short show for his people. He was sure that this will add even more credibility to Dekraft's time as his ultimate prophet. Make the job a little easier for him, it's the least he could do, it's his last gift. Thusly, using the time ring, he returns to the present day, feeling that his task had been completed, and what he saw was something wonderful. Dekraft had done it. He had done it. He knew, right here and now, that he had to show what he achieved to Master Goasu. He was right. To his surprise, he found his master in a meeting with the God of Destruction for Universe 10, Rumshi. They were deciding which planets the latter should be destroying next. I would get rid of Barbari if I were you, my friend. When I was there last time, I hadn't seen them develop in any meaningful way. It is rather sad, but you can always plant life in a different place. 
Perhaps that world just wasn't fit for their destiny. Yes, it is sad. I took Zamasu there recently, but it turned out to be a bit of a pointless gesture. It wasn't a very enlightening trip for the young man. Oh, Zamasu, where have you been? Zamasu looks at them, trying to not let out any emotion or fear to cloud his response. Master, Lord Rumshi, pardon my interjection, but I think destroying Barbary would be a mistake. I think something has changed there since we last visited. Rumshi seems a little bit irritated by this questioning remark from an apprentice. What does your student mean, Goasu? Yes, what seems to be the issue, Zamas? Don't you remember what I said, Master? I said I'd fix Barbary myself. I want you two to come and see what I have managed. All right, I will entertain this escapade a while longer. Kusu, take us to Barbary. The little angel complies and takes the three deities straight to the world. What they encounter is a giant modern metropolis filled with lights and a species that has reached the brink of space travel, laced with beautiful temples and renewable energy sources. Goas and Rumshi are just left slack-jawed with astonishment. Kusu, what is this? I asked you to transport us to Barbary. This is clearly not the right place. This is Barbary, Lord Rumshi. Perhaps my old eyes are playing tricks with me. The Supreme Kai and the God of Destruction were indeed impressed, initially. But then, Rumshi starts to notice the details down on the planet. He notices statues of Zamasu's likeness and a Barbary priest speaking to people down on the concourses below. He was dressed in an attire very reminiscent to what a Supreme Kai would be wearing and had his face ritually painted with green and white hair. This was very suspicious indeed. What is the meaning of this young Kai? The elephant god glaring at Zamasu. Zamas, what did you do? Don't tell me you flouted the ways of the Supreme Kai and actively interfered in these people's lives. I helped them achieve what they could not achieve on their own, Master. I did the work of a god. Look at them now. They are better than ever making examples from many of our greatest worlds. I just gave them that little bit of extra encouragement, realized their full potential. I, you intervened, even though it is forbidden. It is not your job, child. When she was angry. Do you think that we would not guide all these species if we were allowed to? If we could, we could have massive problems here. Goasu, you shouldn't have let this happen. I, I don't know what to say. I won't destroy your pet project, young Kai. At least not yet. This will help our standing with Zeno, after all, it must be said. But one more action like this on my watch, and I will have to report you to the Grand Priest himself. And you could also forget about becoming the next Supreme Kai. Let's go, Kusu. With that, the G.O.D. departs along with his angel. Zamas was fuming inside. How dare that pink buffoon dictate him what his duties are as a god? He glanced over to his master. Are you angry with me too? No, just disappointed. I guess this is my fault for not telling you how crucial it is for the mortals to develop on their own. But how are we supposed to be gods if we cannot intervene? Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to do nothing. Goasu turns away. Let's go home. The two of them go home without further discussion, but Zamasu took the first chance that he could to come back and behold his new world free from judgmental gazes. He didn't care what his superiors said. He was watching it from a safe distance now. He'll be a bit more careful. He knew that he was right though. If the Omni King wants higher mortal levels, this is the way to do it. So, what was that all about? He heard in an old raspy voice from behind. He almost jumps. He didn't expect anyone to be behind him. He turns around to see a cloaked, old, no, ancient barbarian looking at him, smiling. That elephant fellow was pretty angry with you, my lord. The purple eyes were looking at him, and the smile was very familiar. This can't be. It had been centuries. He should be gone by now. He was shocked. Oh, how are you still alive, Dirkraff? It had been centuries since they last met. Well, seconds for Zomas, but you know what I mean. And really, Dekroff looked it. The Kai knew that these creatures lived a decent amount of time, but this long? He never expected this. Oh, and here I was hoping that this visit was intentional. Well, never mind that. 
It is good to see you as well, my lord. Zamas looked stumped. He could barely muster up the words to describe his astonishment. Not a lot of things did surprise him nowadays, but this? This did. What do you mean by intentional? Is this... all this... my doing? Dekraf bows his head in the mocking fashion that Zamasu had actually gotten rather fond of. At least his sassy attitude was still there. Something familiar at least was on display. That is the best explanation that I can give you, yes. After you saved my life, all those centuries ago, something happened. What you did to me to save my life changed me. Not just in my mind, but my body. I seem to have become immortal. Although, perhaps a better choice of word would have been eternal. Zamasu extremely confused. How was that possible? He never intended to bestow immortality to Dekraf. He thought he would just pass on the job to someone else when he would succumb due to natural aging. The elderly dino shrugs. I'm pretty sure, though, if someone were to stab me in the right place with something pointy, then I would succumb to that injury again. But then again, I might not. I'll be honest, I've not really had the inclination to test my theory out. A dry reptilian laughter comes out of Dekraf's mouth. Zamas nods. He sort of understands? So, does this mean that you ascended? Are you the absolute leader of the society? Ha! <laughs> Hardly. I gave up on that venture centuries ago. I followed your example, my lord, like you did with myself. I decided that my people could not be reliant on me forever. They needed time to figure things out for themselves. Some stuff needed to come out from their mind before they could become truly great. Of course, there were some conflicts along the way, a couple of battles, even the odd cataclysm. <laughs> that was actually pretty good fun, to be honest. Things would calm down sooner or later, with a little nudge from myself in the right direction. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I'm not entirely alone. I still have an order of loyal subjects who aid me in my mission. A sacred order? That's what they call themselves. Not my idea. But they felt that they needed some kind of banner to feel validated. It's pretty cute if you ask me. If you look closely down there, you can actually see some of them in action, watching us from the buildings. They're pretty good at hiding, I'll give them that. Samas looked around. Indeed, he quickly became aware that numerous hooded figures were watching him from the rooftops and actually from lower levels. But he wasn't aware of their existence before Dekraf pointed them out to him. Well, they are good. And Zamas hated to admit that. It appears that there are more of your kind as well as those that you are beholden to. What was that all about, my lord? I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but that older fellow and his elephant friend looked older than even you. They are in this divine business too, I'm correct. Your superiors, you might say. At first, Zamasu wanted to lash out at Dekra for not minding his own business, but... He couldn't bring himself to do so. After all, he was right. Nothing that he said seemed to be trying to offend him also. But there was no ill intent in his words. And quite frankly, Zamasu felt like he was the only person he could confide in right now. Not even Goasu would listen to him. I suppose I can be honest with you. You have served your time. The older being that looks like me is named Goasu, and he is the current Supreme Kai of our universe. The elephant buffoon is called Rumshi, and he's the destroyer of our universe. The small lady is an angel. They act like a liaison between gods and even higher-ups. You seem to imply that there are more universes. So it seems that our physicists were right. Zamasu looked stunned again. Your physicists predicted that? You mean the mortal trickery of science has graced your world? How is your technology, if I may ask? Dekraf bows his head and recalls this. Well, we recently launched our first successful spacecraft, and we hope that more species in our universe can do the same. It sure is rather lonely once you've figured everything out on this world. Your scientists will be rewarded for their patience, in time. That's pretty impressive, I must be honest. So what does this all make you, my lord? Who are you exactly in the godly ranks? Zamasu takes a deep breath. He really didn't want to say this. I'm a candidate to be the next Supreme Kai. I am an apprentice. We represent the aspect of creation, unlike destroyers who keep bounds by destroying planets that are no longer habitable. At least that's what they're supposed to do. And your master does not appreciate how you helped us. According to the rules, we are not allowed to intervene in the manner that I have done. Silence descends on the two for a good period of time before the disciple speaks. And how would it have ended without your intervention, my lord? When I found you, there were very few redeeming qualities about your species. 
I hope that you will find that an insult. I initially held you in disdain, because you were more interested in fighting and brutal acts than in building a coherent society. This conversation felt almost like a cleansing. Zamasu wasn't sure why. None taken, my lord. Primitive species cannot exactly help themselves in being imbeciles. So, what are we going to do to make your masters fully appreciate your work? Dakraf smiles. Zamasu was shocked to hear this. When he left Dakraf, he was the one who had power over him and was in control. But right now, with Dakraf, he felt like a child who was trying to find support in the aged creature. I don't think we can. The rules are set by either even the higher-ups. Maybe I could persuade my master, but Rumshi might just erase your world out of spite if I dared to goad him even more than I have already. Dakraf turns his head up to the sky. His purple eyes were eyeing the stars for a moment, as if seeking an answer from them. Hmm, <clears throat> that's a shame, but you're always welcome here. Do you want to help me give my people something to think about? As much as they have developed and become a united nation, working together for a better future, let's just say they've become over-reliant on that science. Not that I mind the growth of the scientific mind or progress or anything like that, but from my point of view and observation, it is a little bit wrong when scientists start to think that they understand everything. Would you like to spar with me? Just like the good old days, my lord. Zamas wasn't really sure, but the barbarian's words soothed his ill brow at this time. So, why not humour the old man? I will be gentle with you, Dekrav grins. Oh, you don't have to. Zamasu charges up his keyblade, wondering if Dekrav was able to block it, but the elderly person wasn't there. Instead, he appeared behind his back and sent him flying with not a key blast, but a shockwave. The members of the Sacred Order witnessed all of this, as if they wanted to intervene to help their master, but seemingly, they had faith in him. Zamasu quickly found that their faith was very well placed. Every key blast that he shot at Dekraft missed. He couldn't get at least one strike on him. Every cut with the keyblade was deflected with Dekraft's own keyblade. His own pupil was toying with him. They were flying all over the city, attracting the attention of everybody below. It was frustrating. After some more of this tomfoolery, finally, Zamas was able to end the fight with a punch. Dekra falls down to the ground, but he smiles at Zamasu. Good one, my lord. I'm still miles behind you. No, he wasn't, and Zamasu knew it. This old reptile let him win, let his god emerge victorious. But Zamasu could see his true power lurking deep within him. Yes, his power was fading due to his age, but if he really tried, Zamasu would have been done for. It's a good thing he wasn't here when Dakaroth was in his prime. But this begged a question. Should a mortal have this kind of power? Why did he let him win? Was this a trick? Was Dakaroth that loyal? Yes, that was quite impressive. He offered him a hand and they decided to finish their talks on a nearby rooftop. What do you want to do next? I see that you have everything figured out here. Probably wait. Watch until the day my body gives up on me. I don't know if it's even possible. I've gotten used to being old, but I don't really like the thought of being like this forever. Zamasu looks to the distance. You know, destroyers are chosen for mortal candidates. Dekraf looks at him, puzzled, but not entirely shocked. <laughs> you flatter this old lizard, my lord, but I'm way too old for that. But what if we could do something about that, Dekraf? What if we could make you young again? Would you consider applying then? Do you have that sort of power, my lord? Or is this another ruse? Zamasu closes his eyes. No, but someone must do. Days later, Zamasu was still thinking about that meeting. Gawasu was keeping a closer eye on him, but wasn't exactly forbidding him from visiting Barbary. He wasn't that cruel. Zamasu knew that this master had a soft spot for him. But if there was one person that could help him de-age Dekraf, it could be the sage Master Zuno. Zuno was known to be pretty eccentric, but Zamasu decided to approach him about this question, claiming it was for Master Goasu's sake rather than his own. I'm not a good candidate. I have wasted my master's time. And so I ask you, is there a way to make him younger? Give my master some years back to him, so that means he can give me more time to improve? Help me, Master Zuno, help me! Zuno nods with little fanfare. Oh, there are many ways of making that happen. Alchemy, plastic surgery, super dragon balls. Super Dragon Balls? He heard the legends of the wish-granting orbs from Universes 6 and 7, but 
they would attract too much attention, surely, if he nabbed them for himself. He wasn't even from those universes. Super Dragon Balls? Well, that seems a little bold. Indeed they are. Anything can be granted should you use them. That being said, your wish doesn't seem that hard to fulfill. Universe 7 has a few sets of smaller examples of these balls. I'm sure they will be able to grant a simple wish like this for you. Universe 6 also has a set. Yeah, those smaller sets could work. Universe 7 was way less developed than Universe 10. This sounded like a good idea. Thank you, Master Zuno. I'm sure Master Goasu will appreciate this. So Zamasu had to go to Universe 7 without Goasu knowing. This wasn't a simple affair, I give you that. But he managed to sneak out between his Supreme Kai lessons. He decided to ask the Supreme Kai of Universe 7 for help, selling him the same fairy tale yarn that he did to Zuno. He heard that Shin wasn't the brightest fellow amongst their clan. I think you should believe in yourself more, said Shin, unaware of how ironic that sounded. But if you need help, I think I have a man for the job. Soon enough, Shin's attendant Kibito brought with him a black-haired man in an orange gi. Oh, who is this Supreme Kai? Is this your brother? No, Goku. This is Zamasu from Universe 10. He is seeking a wish on your Dragon Balls to make his Supreme Kai younger. Can you help him? Of course I can! Huh. <laughs> you look like a strong guy, eh, Zamas? Zamasu already knew that he wouldn't get on with this guy, but he acted cordially. Together, they went to his planet, when he learned that this Son Goku was a pretty powerful mortal as well. Apparently, strong enough to even force Beerus to fight him at 70% of his power. Beerus was considered to be pretty impressive in terms of strength. When did these mortals get so powerful? Should they be so powerful? Fortunately for the Kai, Goku was pretty helpful, and when they actually were able to summon the giant dragon, Zamasu stated his wish out loud. I wish to give the being known as Dekraf eternal youth. Oh? Your master's name is Dekraf? <laughs> you guys have funny names. I yes, Son Goku. Thank you for your assistance. No problem. Maybe I can visit your universe one day. We can spar and train together. Oh boy. Zamasu decided to leave this place as fast as he could to see the wish in action. Sure enough, when he got back to Barbary, Dekraf was waiting for him in his robes, but he looked just like the day they first met. I don't know what you did, my lord, but it worked. I'm glad. So, are you ready to change your life forever? <laughs> that would be the fourth time in my lifetime that you said that, but yes, my lord. Dekraf grins at his master. With the use of instantaneous movement, they appeared on Rumshi's planet. This, of course, irritated the pink deity greatly. He didn't really like Zamasu at the best of times. What is the meaning of this? Why did you bring this wretched thing to my planet? Is it not enough that I allowed it to live after your careless- Forgive me, Master Rumshi, but- I think I found a suitable candidate for your eventual successor. You dare to suggest that I even need a replacement? He looks at Kusu, his attendant, as if he wanted support in this matter. Don't discredit this gesture, my lord. I think this could be rather interesting. It's been many years since you had a worthy opponent, master. Perhaps. What is your name, mortal? Dekraf, Lord Rumshi. Well, Dekraf. I'm going to check if you are even worthy of my attention. If you are not, your planet will face my wrath. That way, I know you will go out against me. I am ready. No, no you are not. Hakai. Zamasu's eyes widened as a small purple orb of energy struck his friend, I mean pupil. He had been played. Rumshi had no intention of testing his power. He just wanted to teach Zamasu a lesson no matter the cost. This was unfair. Even Kusu was looking a bit weirded out. For a moment, the barbarian felt a sharp pain in his chest like he feared. The energy hit Dekraf, but much to Rumshi's surprise, it didn't obliterate him in one blast. The barbarian was struggling with the overwhelming power of the energy. It took him a good few minutes and left him utterly exhausted and damaged, but in the end, he did manage to hold the orb of energy in his hands, just like Frieza was able to in the original, much to Kusu's enjoyment, as well as Rumshi's and Zamasu's utter shock. Will that be all, Lord Rumshi? As the dust started to settle after Rumshi's unsuccessful attempt in erasing Dakraf, everyone went quiet. And that in of itself was a rarity these days. He had no clue what he had just seen, but what he did know was that he didn't like it. Not even Zamasu could take joy right now. Or at least, not entirely. He was stunned himself that his pupil effectively negated destroyer energy right there, without even proper training. 
The only two who were smiling at this time were Kusu and Dekrav himself. The young Kai quickly regains his composure and attempts to resume the conversation like nothing had happened. As I was saying, Lord Rumshi, this is merely a small example of what could be possibly achieved. This is merely the beginning. Think what he can do with proper training with yourself or Kusu. All he has done thus far was by his own hands and perhaps a little of my initial guidance. He is quite remarkable. Rumshi's eyes looked panicked for a moment. He didn't actually want to admit that this was true, but the boy was right. His face didn't express this though. He looked as if he was going to strike Dekraf again for defying his will, despite the fact he was actually doing what he was supposed to do and defending himself. But Kusu eased the tension by answering for everybody. Oh, I'm sure the Grand Priest will be glad to hear the news that we have found a future replacement for Lord Rumshi. It's been too long since we had a viable candidate. I miss those days. If I actually recall, the last one met a very tragic end so suddenly. Right, Lord Rumshi? Yeah, yeah, yes, according to said it better myself, Kusu. Oh, don't be alarmed, Lord Rumshi. Look at the bigger picture. Think about this as an insurance policy, a retirement plan. You don't want to be doing this forever, do you? Rumsi gazes at Kusu for a moment and then back to Zamasu. He feels very, very torn. I mean, in a way, she wasn't wrong. After all, Belmod and Universe 11 have been doing this for nearly a quarter of a million years. Nobody was quite sure how long he'd been in the position. He was there for that long. <laughs> It's this creation of yours might be pretty strong for a mortal, but he is still an effect of breaking the rules nonetheless. Therefore, it would be wrong of me to consider him for the role. Consider yourselves lucky that I don't hakai you both for this insubordination. Zamasu bows his head, knowing that he actually had the upper hand despite what Rumshi was saying. Maybe so, but... These are my mistakes, not Dekraf's. His kind is not responsible for the way that they were uplifted. They did all that on their own, without my interference. Meaning that the potential was in them from the very beginning. Isn't that what matters, Lord Rumshi? Future potential? To know that one of our civilizations was capable of such wonders? Dekraf looked at his boss and nodded. Good answer. The Kai had some satisfaction in knowing that the Pink Elephant hated this idea, with every fibre of his being. But Rumshi's fear over Kusu informing the GP about him, erasing a potential God of Destruction candidate who actually showed potential, who actually was pretty good for no valid reason other than his own resentment and pity spite, that was even greater a fear. Truth be told, they didn't know what the Supreme Angel's reaction would actually be, as he was very hard to read, even for his children. Even more so than the Omni King himself, in fact. But he could feel that the angel of his universe was taking her father's side. It was clear to Zamasu that Kusu was really excited about the prospect of training a new candidate. And then judging from her master's posture, it was also very clear that he hadn't been training lately, being quite content with his lot, his power settling at a particular level. Kusu was, without looking at it, bored out of her mind. She could do with a distraction. Despite her small stature, she's actually the eldest out of all the angels. Classic Toriyama subversion there. Then there's the thing that Rumshi was born a mortal, and right now, Zamasu have bombarded him with mortal fears that his time might be limited. All right then, Kusu, you may train with this thing. I have heard that other gods of destruction are training mortals themselves, coming up with tournaments and the like. In my personal reflection, it might not hurt to have a powerful being ready to defend ourselves should we actually be dragged into any affairs. Despite being exhausted from that previous attack, Dekraft senses victory. Thank you, Lord Rumshi. This doesn't mean that I accept your presence here, Lizard. I'll be watching you. Your training here will be the hardest experience that you've ever had, do you hear me? Young Zamasu here might have had a soft spot for your kind, but I do not. If it were up to me, I'd erase your kind right now. And if you don't show adequate progress and devotion to Universe 10, I shall do just that without question. And to prove I'm not bluffing, you'll be there to witness your people being destroyed, all because of your failure. I will make you watch and then destroy you. Dekraft remained steadfast, not flinching once. Rumsi continues, looking flustered that it wasn't getting through. And don't get too excited because you managed to block my energy. That was but a tiny fraction of my power. There's more where that came from. Dekraf smiled as wide as his lizard snout would allow him to. But of course.
Zamasu was absolutely astonished. Deckcraft didn't allow himself to be intimidated at all by Rumshi, though one wrong word could cost him dear. Maybe both of them. Maybe not death, but quite a lot of pain. Then Zamasu thought to himself that maybe he learnt this steadfastness from Deckcraft to not show fear and doubt and appearing that he was in total control. The lizard brain was working better in that regard than Zamasu's own. So, this is goodbye for now, Deckcraft. Deckcraft bows. Thank you, Lord Zamasu, for everything. It will be most interesting to live out my adulthood again. Good luck. Zamasu gives the creature the most honest smile that he has ever given him, since Goasu chose him for his replacement, in fact. I'll see you again someday, my friend. And with that, Zamasu left Dekraft with Kusu and Rumshi, hoping that their plan will work and that the Barbarian will be resilient enough to survive. Later that day, the young Kai rejoined his master, Goasu, who was meditating outside his house. Oh, Zamasu, it's good that you are here, my boy. Were you visiting your friends again? No, master. It's all right, you can tell me. I'm not going to judge. Zamasu then decides to tell his master about bringing Dekra forward as a candidate for the God of Destruction position, though he did omit some bits, like the whole part of making him young again with the Dragon Balls, nor did he reveal his visit to Zuno, or the true reason behind him setting Dekra on a journey to become the new destroyer. He simply stated that, oh, he was impressed by his power solely and loyalty, and felt that Lord Rumshi just was very frustrated about his job and wanted a change. Goasu sighs loudly. I hope you know what you're doing. He's not going to have an easy time, Zamas. I've known Rumshi for quite a long time. He is very fond of destroying planets for small things, nor is he eager to be persuaded to change his ways. But he is very attached to the position. In a way, this is the only thing he has, Zamasu. It's quite tragic, really. He's still my friend, though, but he is rather complicated. Brawny, but unwilling to cause destruction. Proud, but very inactive. Then, does that mean that Dekraf would be safe? The older Kai shakes his head. Not necessarily. You two have wounded his pride. A wounded animal can become an absolute beast when provoked. You have woken him up from his marasmus, and he will take that out on your friend. Do not think otherwise. He is still our destroyer, and his anger is terrifying. Samasu looks away. He looks hurt, but also vindicated. He felt that this was yet another good reason to replace Rumshi with someone who was actually more competent, but he didn't want to speak out of turn to his master right now. I suppose I owe you an apology, Samas. Goasu looks miserable for a moment. I took you to these people. I've shown you probably the worst part of mortal life in our universe. That was on me, and you changed it into something wonderful. But. I didn't fully explain to you why we shouldn't interfere. Zamasu then recites from his memory what Goasu had taught him, as if it was second nature. Well, I do know, because we should allow the mortals to develop at their own pace. We only intervene against supernatural threats. Goasu looks him right in the eyes. That's not the only reason. We avoid it because we live for thousands of years. Hundreds of thousands, in fact. For us, their lifetime is like a flickering flame of a candle. The worst thing that can happen to a Supreme Kai is to get attached to a mortal. The pain, the pain is just too much. Zamasu says nothing, and for some time, himself and Goasu just sit there totally quiet. Meanwhile, Dekra's training had started properly, and Rumshi wasn't joking when he said that he would be giving him a hard time. Every test that Kusu put before him, Rumshi made even harder by adding his own elements. This caused the Barbarian to struggle and fail a lot, but the Destroyer God wasn't actually that proactive with his promise to erase him, even if he did show a lack of progress. After all, at the slow pace Dekraft was progressing, it was in a way stalling for time. It meant that in a way, Rumshi's place was safe. You know, it gave him confidence, overconfidence. And besides, Dekraft knew that the Elephant was enjoying torturing him too much to actually blast him away. Instead, the Dino bottled all his resentment up, as well as his anger. He was very good at that. This was his silent victory, he thought. Politeness. No matter what room she threw at him, Dekraft would never show signs of disrespect, even though that's exactly what room she wanted to see. He was pretty close, though, to it at times. 
But what Rumshi didn't know was that in the young body of Dakraf was a mind of a calculating old man who had conquered his demons ages ago. Rumshi thought that he would be dealing with an impertinent young being, but quite the opposite. Every time he didn't give Rumshi the satisfaction, he could mark one small victory against his tormentor. He did respect Kusu, however. She was a good mentor and a patient teacher, and with time, he learned of things that were pretty impressive on a mortal level. To make his progress actually mean something, he needed to start to delve into the energy of destruction directly, and to do so, he needed to be exposed to more of it. He then convinced Kusu that she should ask Rumshi to help him with that endeavour. Dekraf knew exactly what would happen if he asked directly, the Destroyer God would never even consider it. But when his own angel would be giving him a free chance at target practice, well, let's say Rumshi would be pretty eager. The first few attacks were pretty tame for Dekraf, even to Rumshi's surprise. After all, he mostly remembered the lizard being being hit during the training, but that was the one thing that made him so resilient. But things weren't going so smoothly when Rumshi decided to, without telling anyone, increase the dose, being at times dangerously close to erasing Dakraf altogether. The barbarian was however relentless, and he wanted this training every single day, each time pushing his threshold a little bit further. Then one day, when Rumshi grew bored of this whole charade, and decided to end the training earlier by shooting a much more concentrated blast than had previously been anticipated, instead of gradually increasing the power, something happened. Dekraft did not deflect the energy. He took it. He finally had absorbed it. He allowed it to become part of himself, to flow through his body without fear of erasure. At this time, he went from being subjected to the pain of the energy to actually generating it himself. It scared Rumshi endlessly. He had made a mistake. When he saw Dekraft growing and expanding due to his own blast, he rushed towards him in a desperate attempt to knock the power out of the body with his fist, but a massive arm blocked it. Dekraft was towering over him, now with a red mark representing Universe 10 emblazoned on his chest, his eyes glowing with the same purple light as did the aura around him. Thank you, Lord Rumshi said Dekraf, releasing the Destroyer God's hand and gently reverting back to his normal look. Very, very good, Dekraf. See? That, that's how you do it. I, I meant to check how you could focus your energy. And you passed. See? My training does yield results. Dekraf smiles again. Of course. Later that day, Kusu told everything that had just happened to Zamasu. I'm so proud of Dekraf. He finally achieved the Destroyer form. Now when someday Lord Rumshi resigns, he can rest easily, knowing that he has such a strong replacement. Zamasu smiles to himself. Oh, Kusu, he thought. That day may come much earlier than you might expect. After this incident, in which Dekraf had proved him utterly and completely wrong, the Pink Elephant's composure started to slowly warp and break down. Going from this calm and collected leader, he was starting to make mistakes, snap at any given moment, and most importantly, show signs of fear and intimidation towards his pupil, to which said pupil took great mirth and satisfaction from. I mean, to be honest, you would too if you were in the dino's boots. Almost at once, like a light switch being flicked on, he had stopped tormenting his new student, to which Dekraft was most grateful for. It made the days truly fly by, knowing he was strong and that his master was scared of him, and it also made Kusu happy to see him thrive in this environment. But at the same time, Rumshi's disdain was replaced by panic. After weeks of the situation, he could not take it anymore. He decided that he needed to go to the source and confront Goasu about this. All of this. Goasu, as usual, was busy with his tea-drinking routine. I mean, that's pretty much what he does nowadays. I mean, I bet if he could, he'd have been drinking tea during the Vegito Zamasu battle in the original series. Thinking that Rumshi being here was just a regular visit and a catch-up, Gosu motioned to an empty chair in an amiable manner. Ah, Rumshi, my friend. What brings you to... With no sign of a greeting, Rumshi slammed his hand on the table, shaking it violently. We need to talk! Rumshi looked around in a pretty paranoid manner, which perturbed and concerned Gosu greatly. Is... is... Is Zamasu here? Uh, no. I've sent him to do some tasks for me. He still needs to make up for his errors in judgment. Rumshi's eyes widened with dread. Was Zamasu maybe getting another deckcraft lined up, perhaps? Another apprentice to try and get him? Uh, and, and you let him go alone? After everything he has done? Think of what he could be doing without you knowing it! For shame, Goasu! 
Romsi tried to sound more angry, but he was sounding more like scared. He was failing miserably. Well, yes, naturally. How could he be in the next Supreme Kai if I didn't allow him to do his duties? However, I'm sensing a greater problem here. You seem very tense. What has happened, my friend? Goasu was visibly showing concern for his more animalistic friend. And realizing that he needed to vent badly to one of his oldest allies, Rumshi took the vacant chair and shakily helped himself to some tea. I... I think they're after me, Goasu. The Supreme Kai fixed his gaze with a sincerity and raised his eyebrow. This was something that he couldn't take lightly. After you? Who? Who is after you? You know exactly! They're planning to get rid of me! I'm certain of it! Goasu gave him a light smile. Rumshi, think about this rationally. You are a god of destruction. There are no assassins in this universe capable of handling your power. Your student and his reptile! They are more than capable of offing me! And... And... And possibly my attendant is on it as well. They're all in on this. Goasu gave a deep sigh. Rumchi, look at me. No one is after you. What those three are doing are what they are meant to do. Uphold the rules of our society and how it functions. They merely brought to you a suitable replacement candidate whom you will make your successor. Only, mind you, when you decide to step back and not before. Rumshi's hands slowly started to settle hearing this. Gawasu pressed on. You told me yourself just a while back that you were thinking about stepping down after I leave my post. Doing this together, you said. I'm preparing Zamasu to replace me, just as you are doing with this Dekra fellow. It's nothing to be afraid of. You've worked very hard, my friend. You deserve some time to rest, as do I. Rumshi realized that Goasu was telling the truth, but there were still some troubles clouding his mind. Did you know that he traveled to Universe 7 before recruiting that... that thing? Who did? Zamasu. He traveled to Universe 7? Why? He has no business or power in that realm. Gawasu's calm face then contorted into a more serious position. This... this was concerning. He hadn't taught Zamasu to be gallivanting off on his own to other universes without his supervision, or even his permission. He had gone there on his own, without any edict or guidance. Not that Goasu saw something bad about Zamasu educating himself about other universes. I mean, that was part and parcel of the gig. But he should have at least informed his master about his trip there, or at least what he was planning to do, right? There was a time that they trusted each other without question. But after this whole Barbary thing, it wasn't all that simple anymore. Goasu had doubts. That being said, it wasn't best to voice these doubts to Rumshi right now in their full force. It'd be counterintuitive. I'm sure there is nothing to worry about. But if it makes you feel at least slightly more calm, I will contact the Supreme Kai of Universe 7 about his visit. How do you know he went there anyway? Rumshi tried a pretty poor attempt of looking smug in his current state. I... I... I have my eyes and ears everywhere, my friend. Well, then you should know for sure that there is no threat lurking for you. Now, excuse me, I have to go and visit Universe 7. Rumshi got up and saw himself out, feeling a little better that nobody was out to get him right now, and that his friend was on the case too. Golosu decided to follow through with his own investigation. He didn't like seeing his G.O.D. friend getting unsettled like this. It hurt him so, seeing him in turmoil. But there was also another reason for this. What if his overreactions caused any diplomatic scandals, or maybe ire from the Omni King? One thing's for sure, it's not good to have a G.O.D. feeling cornered. As soon as Goasu arrived on the Sacred World of the Kaiser of Universe 7, he felt at ease. This place was very mellow. Right away, he was welcomed by Shin, who seemed very surprised by something. Yes, do I look odd to you, perhaps? Goasu smiled patiently at Shin. Uh, no, it's just... Shin bit his tongue to not reveal that he expected to see him in a younger form. Were you expecting someone else? Zamasu, perhaps? My student? Why, yes, he's your student. Gosh, it's an honor to meet his master. In answer to your question, though, uh, yes, he was gathering Earth's Dragon Balls in order to, um, uh... Gaza looked worried for a moment. In order to what, exactly? I'd best take you to Son Goku. 
He was the one directly helping Zamasu in finding them. And so Shin and Kibito took Goasu to Earth, and after meeting Goku and explaining that this is the Supreme Kai of Universe 10, our Saiyans seemed pretty pumped. Oh, you must be Deathcraft! <laughs> Gee, I don't want to know how old you were before that wish, but yeah, you don't look that bad. But to be honest, I'm never really sure with you Kais. Goasu was very confused with this mortal's enthusiastic jabbering. What? No, M my name is Goasu. Wait, did you say Dekraf? Son Goku, may I ask you something? What exactly did Zamasu wish on your Dragon Balls? After then getting the explanation, Goasu went pale. Not only had Zamasu travelled without consulting him, but he had also acted in a deceptive manner for his own personal gain. Romshi might be onto something after all. Granted, he was glad that his friend wasn't deranged, but there were other worries bearing fruit. Why would he use these balls on this barbarian, specifically this one? Was this all innocent? Was he just wanting to truly see his potential and give him a fair chance at the job? Or was Rumshi right all along and they were planning to get rid of him? Shin, Son Goku, thank you for all of this information. It has helped answer many questions, but if you will excuse me, I'd better get going. Meanwhile, as Goasu made his way back home, Zamasu was enjoying a moment of solitude in the gardens of his Kai planet, but he wasn't expecting his master to visit him at this time of day. Master Goasu, I hadn't expected you here this early. Goasu wasn't letting anything show. He kept his cool in this fraught moment. Don't worry, my boy. I merely wanted to check up on you. Oh? I heard that this prodigy of yours is doing pretty well to keep old Rumshi on his toes. Surprisingly good. Dekrath? Zamasu smiled with pride. Yes, this is a good example of what mortals can achieve if they work more actively with us. So much progress in such a short time? When I'm Supreme Kai, I will ensure that all mortals get to fully realize their capabilities. A little too actively if I heard correctly. Zamasu's look gets more stern. What do you mean, Master? Zamasu. Why did you travel to Universe 7 without telling me? The younger Kai felt like his innards were twisting inside. His master was cross with him. Also, he'd found out. How? How did he find out? This could end everything he'd worked towards. He had to tread carefully here, or else Deckcrab might be in danger. I... I just wanted to... Zamasu, tell me. Why did you insist on Deckcrab of all beings to become Rumshi's apprentice? I have to know. Not as your superior, not as your mentor, but as your friend. Tell me the truth, or else this might lead to dire consequences. For a moment, Zamasu felt how easy it would be just to solve the problem. It'd be simple to just slice the old man down, cut his throat with a keyblade and be done with it. Doing that would also get rid of that pesky Rumshi. They are connected to each other after all. He and Dakroff would then have a free path towards their positions. Kurosu's not going to get in the way. And after that, they could rebuild Universe 10, just as they did with Barbary, to make it a place where mortals and gods cooperated and coexisted with each other to create something beautiful. His universe. Zamasu felt his key started to gather around his fingers and looked in the wise old eyes of his master. But something clicked. In an instant, the key went away. No. No, it couldn't do this. It wouldn't be right. Gowasu cared for him for years, centuries even. He'd done nothing wrong. Even if they did disagree from time to time about things, he didn't deserve to be struck down like this so cruelly. Even Rumshi didn't deserve it. No, no, he will go straight. He will allow Dekraf to beat Rumshi fair and square. Zamasu just gave him a leg up is all. Yeah, everything else was down to the barbarian. I, I thought he would be a good fit for a god of destruction after you after I assume your position. I felt that we could work well together and make Universe 10 better. I just, I, I trust him, Master. I wanted to show you two that you were wrong about my involvement with Barbary. It wasn't pointless. Gowasu closed his eyes. Surprisingly, Zamasu saw him look more relieved than disappointed. Oh, Zamasu. The younger Kai looked at his master puzzled. I just hope. I just hope that the Omni King will see eye to eye with you. Good luck, my student. And he just left. Just like that. Leaving Zamasu with only his thoughts. He didn't want to leave things like this with Goasu, his closest friend and teacher, angry with him. Not really. 
He cared for the old fool more than he was willing to admit. And the Omni King and the Grand Priest? Why would they care? They hardly visited Universe 10 or took active interest in its well-being. Why should they even care or have to know about this? Zamasu doubted they would even bat an eye about it. The very next day, Zamasu decided to just make peace with Goasu the way he knew best. He prepared his favourite breakfast and his favourite tea. He walked to his quarters and knocked on the door. But there was no response. The young Kai waited a few minutes just to check whether Goasu was awake or not, and then knocked again. And again. The door crept open, and before his divine brain could fully register what he saw, he dropped the food tray. Goasu was laying on the floor, his eyes wide open, with a gaping wound in his chest. Someone had murdered his master. Zamasu's mind was racing. He had no idea what happened here. He had no clue as to who had slain his master. He recalled their last meeting just the other night, remembering how worried he was about his student's attachment to Barbary and its mortals. At the time, he thought that his mentor was worrying over nothing, just caring a little too much. In fact, maybe even getting in his way. But he ultimately didn't wish any ill upon him like this, but here he was, fallen. Now he was no more with a gaping hole in his chest, but he oddly seemed to be peaceful in the oddest of interpretations, like he was just asleep, taking a nap before he would sup his favourite tea that Zamas had prepared, like the attack hadn't happened, not bothered him at all. The Kai didn't know what to think. This kind of thing rarely happens in their world, somebody dying, and especially in this heinous and hideous way. Zamas whose thoughts, however, were orbiting around a grim conclusion. Was this all his fault? Or even worse to think, was was Deathcraft responsible for all this? Had his pupil done this to help his master? Or had he even gone rogue and chose to do this himself? It was hopeless to pin down one specific reason right now. When he was laying out his plan to his Barbary protege, he might have sounded like he was trying to usurp it. Yes, maybe he even believed in that course of action for a brief moment of time, but he never truly wanted Goasu to... What had he done? He moved the body to the bed, so his mentor wouldn't be resting on the floor, so undignified like. But one thing was clear though, what he needed to do now was to talk to Dekroth. With the power of the instantaneous movement technique, he was able to get to Rumshi's planet relatively quickly. It was silent, not a sound could be heard, not even Rumshi typically blustering about in some trivial manner, and Zamasu knew why this was the case. He didn't understand why he even had to ask himself that question. It was clear. Kusu had become inactive, and the elephant god himself would have been dead, since his life, as you know, is linked to the Kai, Goasu, which left only... Master Zamasu, he heard a deep but worried voice of Dekraf behind his back. Dekraf, he eyed his lizard companion, trying to not look too paranoid, acting like he had no inkling or suspicion towards him. But Dekraf didn't look too happy either to see his master, like he usually would. Master, is this all you're doing? Dekraf was pretty direct and looked rather stern. And this, this got under the Kai's skin. Zamasu could feel what seemed like a warm wave of anger starting to rise up inside of his body. How can I be sure that this isn't your doing, Dekraf? But the pupil didn't allow himself to become intimidated. All he did was relax a smidge, appear just a little bit meeker. I found Rumshi today, dead in his chair. Kusu was nowhere to be seen, master. Zamasu looked right in his purple eyes. Right. And I found Master Goasu lying dead on the floor, in his quarters with a huge hole in his chest. Dakarov pondered for a while. Then, I suppose the killing has to have happened on your end. Of course it did, you foolish reptile! Zamasu looked rather irritated. He didn't know if Dakrav was playing games with him, or was maybe trying to make fun of the situation. He wouldn't put that past him though, Dakrav could be very slippery when he wanted to be. But the diner person sighed loudly. No, you misunderstand me, master. If it happened on your side, then I had no way of doing it. I don't know instantaneous movement, remember? I have no way of moving around the universe so fast. Zamasu paused. There was logic in what he said. He was... he was right. Akraf couldn't have done that. Not without help, of course. 
And Kusu wouldn't aid him with this either. I mean, sure, she had been certainly excited to see Dakraf rising up the ranks because the new G.O.D. was on their way, but she had patience. It was one of her virtues. She could wait. He also doubted that other barbarians would be able to surprise Goasu. Dakraf was by far their strongest being. He felt like an idiot, though, but realised how overly reliant he had become with teleportation. It becomes so obvious to him, in fact, that he forgot that other divine beings who weren't Supreme Kais or Kais in training couldn't do it. You're right, Dakraf. Forgive me. I'm just... I'm just shaken. The barbarian nodded his head. So if it's neither of us who did it, who could it have been? Zamasu started to ponder this himself. There weren't exactly that many options to ponder, though. Other universal agents? Was that pesky Universe 9 again? Why would they be interested in harming Universe 10? A demon, perhaps? Zamasu hadn't heard anything, though, about Master Goasu having any grievances or being at odds with any demonic entities lately. Or at all. He then decided to examine the scene of the crime at Rumshi's place, or lack thereof. The Elephant God was sitting in his favourite chair, his eyes closed, with his right hand lying on his stomach. It was probably on his heart the moment he had died, but it had slid down in the meantime. Not much to see here, clearly. It certainly looked less gruesome than the situation with his master. Then, he took Dakraf with him to show Goasu's body. He explained the previous position he was found in, and what had happened going on. Everything was laid bare to the dino person. Zamasu also explained that he wanted to bring the old Kai his favourite tea during his usual breakfast time. That's how he found him. Dakraf examined the wound. I've seen many stab wounds in my lifetime. I think with a keyblade. The one that you and I... Dakraf, you are not helping! I told you that it wasn't, and I believe that, Master. I'm telling you what are the facts. We are not the only ones that are capable of doing this. Proving his point. Dakraf materialised a keyblade and left a hole in a nearby pillow, similar in shape and size to Goasu's wound. Zamasu blinked. You think... you think Goasu might not have been alerted to the assailant's presence? That this was a, a surprise attack? The only person he could have expected was you, right? Zamasu looked at Goasu for a while, and he might have assumed the assassin for me. If this person could produce my keyblade... He could also maybe mimic my appearance. But why? Dakraf did not have an answer to that. What do we do now, Master? Is there a procedure for this sort of thing? Zamasu looked around. I... I really don't know. I'm still the candidate, but somehow something's not right. I should be promoted by now to the Supreme Kai role, but I think we need Kusu for that. And she's inactive, whatever that means. What would a person get from having both the God of Destruction and Supreme Kai out of the picture? Zamasu thought about that for a moment. An unprotected and unsupervised universe. We should see how the universe is doing. He tried to focus on its life force, to reach out towards the planets. He still hadn't fully mastered this technique yet, as he was not able to fill out life forms specifically around the whole universe as skillfully as his master could. But he was able to do enough to connect to a world close to his heart. To their heart. He gasped, though. Dekraf, we have to go! What? What? What happened, Master? You're, you're concerning me. The lizard almost jumped. Barbary is in danger! We must go! As soon as they got to the planet, the two of them found only ash. The beautiful cities of Barbary were now in ruins and flames. It had been completely destroyed. Now, a husk of a world. Zamasu could see how this broke Dekraf's heart, and to be frank, his own heart as well. Who? Who? Who could have? Dekraf was at a loss for words. Zamasu hadn't seen him like that in a very long time. And then he saw the culprit, standing in the ruins of the city before them. Son Goku. Son Goku, why? What does Universe 7 want from? The creature looked at him, smiling. It was unlike that irritating goopal from Universe 7 that he'd met before. This didn't seem right. Had he a twin or something? He was wearing black robes, and there was something more behind the Saiyan's face. Something different, eerily familiar. You surprised us. We thought you two were gonna blame each other. And to be frank, I hoped that you would have gotten rid of that lizard, but here we are. Zamasu was shocked to hear his own voice speaking through these different vocal cords. He noticed a second being. It was like 
looking in the mirror. Who, who are you? Show your true faces! Why are you doing this? This is unacceptable! His evil twin laughed, as did the one looking like Son Goku. This is my true face. I am you. And he is you. Just doing a little experiment with a Saiyan body. Look deep within yourself, and you will realize that we are both you. We are from a different timeline, a better one. Dekraft looked completely blown away by this, and Zamasu... Zamasu realized they weren't lying. Those two... they were... they were... but why? We felt an unusual activity of the Time Ring in this dimension, and so we decided to investigate thinking that you two were hatching a very clever plan of your own to fulfill our destiny. But it turns out that you are the black sheep of the family. De destiny Black grinned menacingly and started talking. You seriously went ahead and helped those savages become civilized? Did you really think that that was possible on their own? How much of that did they really achieve under their own guidance? Without you, they would be a waste of space, like all mortals. We have seen it. So, we decided to start off our mission here by culling your pets. To teach you a lesson. The only way is our way. But Black wasn't smiling for long as Dekroff had powered up and sent him flying through a nearby ruined building. The evil Zamas who scoffed at Arkai. <laughs> Please, don't tell me you are going to take the lizard's side. You can still join us, you know. It's not too late. Together, we could create a perfect universe. One without mortals, without savagery, without imperfection. You, you two are crazy! I once thought about that vision, sure, but I had long deemed it preposterous. What is a universe without mortals? What is a god without followers? Wha what madness is this? And with that, Arzamasu started his insane blade duel with his evil counterpart. Meanwhile, Dekroff started fighting Black. He quickly went Super Saiyan Rosé in order to overpower his enemy, but Dekraf, who he'd been training for long enough to be able to hold up against that, which angered Black greatly. He launched a massive Kamehameha at Dekraf, which made good Zamasu have to step in and help his friend with deflecting the attack. In the meantime, evil Zamasu cut his face with the Keyblade. At least it would be easier for Dekraf to tell them apart. But Black then decided to go all out with his special scythe against Dekraf. But the Barbarian remembered Kusu's training and dodged the attack. Then he decided to go for it. He started to focus destruction energy around his body. He was able to do this one time successfully, but only in the presence of actual energy. Now everything, everything relied on him being able to do this without a hitch. Dekraft didn't want to fail Zamasu or his people or reality. He closed his eyes and started to grow, now towering over his opponent. Now what he needed was just one firm grasp over Black's neck. The Saiyan-disguised Kai attempted to slice him with the scythe, but Dekraf was able to catch him. <laughs> Don't touch me, you dirty lizard! Silence, scum! He hadn't truly mastered it, he wasn't at full pelt, but it didn't matter. The amount of destruction energy that he had right now was able to tear a screaming Black into pieces. Black was no more. The evil Zamasu seemed mildly irritated by this, and our Zamasu took this opportunity to stab him through the heart. But the enemy just laughed at him and shot him back with a powerful key blast. Our Zamasu was shocked. How could he survive that? It's a shame that your pet took black, but that won't work on me. I am immortal, you simpletons, and I will wear you two down in the fullness of time. Then, I will use your world to create my own power- A punch from Dakraft sent him flying through the air! Oh, I've wanted to do that for quite some time. No offense, master. Zamasu eyed Dakraft. It was clear that he would not be able to keep the destroyer form for long. You need to get help, master. I can hold him off for a while. But- Kai Kai, remember? Yeah. Yeah. And Zamasu reluctantly teleported out. Evil Zamasu was, however, pretty furious with Dekraf, starting to attack him with far greater intensity. And while initially Dekraf had the upper hand, his destroyer transformation couldn't last for much longer. And when he sadly turned back into his regular form, he got stabbed repeatedly by Zamasu in a fit of pure catharsis on the latter's part. It makes me sick that a version of me entrusted anything to something 
so repulsive. I will tear you apart, limb from limb, said Zamasu, lifting Dekrop by the head, ready to start slicing him. Then, unexpectedly, his hand froze, making Zamasu realize that he wasn't going anywhere. His facial expression changed from triumph to panic as he saw the other Zamasu accompanied by the GP himself. But, but he will punish you as well for helping them live! The GP gave evil Zamasu a neutral yet somehow stern look, and then he smiled. The evil Zamasu looked at his hand. It had become translucent, and before he was able to deal a final blow to Dekraft, to anyone, he vanished. Zamasu quickly approached Dekraft to heal his wounds, and then he knelt deeply at the GP's feet. I don't usually intervene myself, but since Kusu had become inactive, and there is no supervision over Universe 10, I could make an exception. Also, you violating rules established by the great Zeno himself in year 43 of the Divine Calendar was indeed enough chutzpah for me stepping in. Zamasu uttered just a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace. This place seemed like a beautiful world at one time, before now. A very special world, Your Grace. But there are other worlds that deserve to be protected, you know. And since your master is no longer around, we need to give that honor to you. Kusu will have to work on our new God of Destruction candidate. Zamasu said nothing. What's the matter? Is this not what you wanted? The GP looked at Zamasu. I... I don't think we're ready yet. The GP looked mildly curious. Interesting. Yet you thought you were ready to rule over this planet. He looked at the statues of Zamasu, currently crumbling. That... that wasn't what I... But you did. You left your mark. And you played favorites. Something that we supreme divine beings shouldn't be doing. Dekra finally uttered a word. Your Grace, I think Master Zamasu has helped us greatly, but what we've achieved, what we've reached was our own hard work. We just needed a little direction. The GP smiled at Dekra. So what are we going to do with you two? Zamasu looked into the GP's eyes. You can punish me, Your Grace, but Dekra was only trying to help his people. This... This planet, it should live again, as should Master Goasu and Lord Rumshi. The GP walked towards Zamasu. Hmm, you are asking for a lot, Kai, and what you ask is against the balance of things. As we have seen today, there are timelines where you are not very fond of this balance. How can I be sure that you are not the same? But regardless, I am not here to punish you for what you could do. I am asking, what can you offer in return? The only thing I have, Your Grace. My life. Dekraft looked alert. M master Are you sure? Yes. This is all I have, Your Grace. The GP nodded. All right, then. Master, you cannot do this! You've already done so much for us! Zamasu smiled sadly at Dekraft. Not enough, it seems. Not yet. Thank you, Dekraft. For everything. It's been the greatest adventure of my life. Dekra felt his eyes drowning with tears as he saw his master walk away from him. No. Master! The GP took Zamasu's hand, the former nodding and saying something that Dekra couldn't quite hear. And then, in a flash of purple light, the Kai disappeared, leaving him and the barbarian across the populated square of his homeworld. It was as if nothing had happened. Stores were open, the city bustling, the barbarians talking casually, as if it was just a regular day. Is Master gone? The GP looked at Dekraft curiously. Yes and no. What about you? What do you wish to do? Dekraft pondered for a while. If it's not a problem, Your Grace, I'd like to finish my training with Kusu and Lord Rumshi, as intended. I want to serve Universe 10 the best I can. The GP smiled. I was hoping you would say that. Come on, I can give you a lift. They teleported to Goasu's place, where Kusu was trying to calm down a rather agitated Rumshi and the older Kai. When they saw Dakraf and the GP, both of them fell to their knees. The GP explained what had occurred, much to Dakraf's surprise. He was sure to mention that they owe their lives to Zamasu's sacrifice. The GP was bigging them up, and that he is leaving Dakraf here in their capable hands. Rumshi looked at the barbarian, and all his anger and steam seemed to just wash away. I guess we started off on the wrong foot, Barbarian. Or should I say, Dekraf. Are you ready to start over? Maybe. Maybe you really are a worthy replacement. It will be my honour, Lord Rumshi. 
but only when you are ready. And for the first time, the God of Destruction gave him an honest smile of relief. Meanwhile, the GP was readying himself to leave when he was approached by Goasu. P pardon me, Your Grace. Is Zamasu truly gone? The father of all angels looked at Goasu, smiling. If I wanted to tell you something obvious, I would tell you that no one is truly gone, so long as you remember them. But in Zamasu's case, Universe 10 isn't exactly done with him yet. And as such, he nodded at Dekraf, Rumshi, and Kusu, and was gone. The four of them would have to work together now to ensure the bright future for Universe 10, especially with the Tournament of Power coming up, would not be extinguished. And meanwhile, though, in another time, another place, in a poor Babari village torn by religious wars, a child was born. It was originally pretty weak, not as well built as other barbarians, but his mother claimed he was special. Not only did he have those beautiful purple eyes, but she loved to describe that when he had hatched, it was accompanied by a flash of purple light. She thought that that was a sign from the Creator, and even though when he grew up, he didn't wish to believe in the Creator, Dekraft's mother always told him that the Creator believed in him. And as for time, well, time is just a flat circle. I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later.